I recognize maybe about half the people in the room. Uh, I'm happy to see new faces that I don't know. Chicago is to me like one of the most dynamic coffee cities, very historic for a lot of people who maybe haven't been in the scene for very long. Uh, everyone from Chris Schooley, who was one of the founding members of the reason why a lot of small roasters are having access to very small lots. Um, he was, you know, basically uh, roasting at Metropolis way back in the day. I think uh, there's another company probably no one knows here uh, was by Jared, who, or Joel, who is uh, over QC at Red Fox now. He had a roasting company here probably 20 some odd years ago. Uh, and you know, there's a host of names that you do all know now. Um, but what I think I wanted to focus on in this talk is really a summation of a lot of the research, a lot of the energy that I put into stuff. Um, we were going to have like a larger display of some sort of visual, but we're all going to like peek over here uh, every time, once in a, you know, once in a while. Um, I'll set you all up. Uh, the idea of this was really like, is it good? Like, what is, what's a generous hospitality experience that's memorable, that's unique? Um, and also, I think we're in a realm where there's a lot of roasters for a moment. It was all about passion, and then it went to how do I pay the bills? And then I want to scale everything. And there kind of became this level of maybe questionability around uh, the humanness of things, the quality of things. Um, you know, does the customer actually know? What are they buying? So I'm kind of getting up here a little bit more unearthing. Well, let's look at some other industries. Let's look at some other spots and people. Um, so yeah, this first one is really, a little bit cheeky too because I think the the good is referencing subjective and objectivity and taste and that's something that can you know get all people riled up um, but what I would probably advocate for you is if you don't acknowledge objectivity as a play within our realm of specialty coffee uh, you I would say you're toothless about making meaningful impact towards the farmer and that farmer is the most disadvantaged part of the whole supply chain. So you need to be able to communicate in ways that are uh, referencing quality, re referencing some sort of thing that they can chase after. And it's not elusive. Uh, so we're kind of gonna get in the retail experience a little bit. We'll go down to the next part. Um, you may have heard the Steve Jobs uh, quote, uh, most people don't know what they want. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that before. Um, so. If you are working for a roasting company, many roasting companies, the secret behind everything is um, there's this natural thing. You'll be going and going and going, and the coffees that you want to sell, maybe your customer isn't actually buying. And you kind of start to resent your customer in a realm of like, I wish they would just dig on this and they just want to buy this. And so it's this, this framework that starts forming around like, well, they don't know what they want. I'm just gonna you know, do this and this. And so I would kind of advocate a little bit um, maybe he wasn't as smart as we think he was. If you go to the next slide. Uh, let's cross out a couple things and add a couple things. So what if we look at it more as like all people know what they like? And if they know what they like, but we would maybe concede that they may not know what they, they want, then to me, I would say your job, our job is literally smack dab in that middle part. Like how can you provide a meaningful, accessible conduit for someone to freely express themselves of what they like and not just listen to the latest YouTube influencer or you know, me, I'm representing a manufacturer. Like, you know, th there's all these things like the goal should be driven by quality and deliciousness and you to trust yourself and figure out what you like. Your like may be different, this like and this like, but we shouldn't negate that there is no quality. Um, if that's the case, we're not going to be studying Bauhaus and architecture. We're not going to be improving quality and innovation and things. Um, you need a reference point. Um, now I will um, move it forward that his actual quote I'll read. Um, that's the problem with history. People usually manipulate things. Um, his, his real quote was really around, um, it was around an essence of that he felt people he felt people didn't really uh, necessarily know what they want and he needs to explore this avenue of expressing their sort of preference. So he's kind of like similar to my thing, but he was kind of pushing against the market researchers of the world, which is interesting. So he's like, I'm not, I'm not designing based on market research. I'm designing based on those impressions of what people give and then I'm going to design the same thing in the future. 
So if you think about Apple with the next slide with this, uh, well, yeah, that one. Um, I mean, that's Chicago Tribune building, Apple's iconic location. They're basically building an environment that allows the customer to freely get their hands on something and decipher, do I like this or not? Do I want this? You know, do I, is it really worth it? They're going to pick this up. They're going to feel it, um, even though it's six times the cost of some other phone. Um, so for me, they're actually making the user experience real. And that's fascinating for a technology company because the technology company, it's all about data and you know, user interface um, you know, details and tech. But uh, I, I feel like that's almost like this little valuable insight uh, for us to kind of explore. I don't know, I guess maybe like how could we ourselves think about providing a space for our customer to more freely express what they like and get interested because you know cognitively coffee in relation to many other sectors it's a ritualistic relationship like you are habitually partaking in this thing whether it's through caffeine whether it's through just straight up ritual you wake up you want to do the coffee you may not even like it so intrinsically that relationship is going to be different than many other things in your home or in your life um, and then we're functioning like this business or this entity like hey you need this and check this out and you know Lamar Zucco is selling a crazy amount of linear minis at home now so we have a whole new realm who they're really into it and if they go into a shop and that barista is not really dialed in and the coffee isn't tasting great then they think oh I can just get a better coffee at home that's a catastrophic you know issue potentially for our industry when's the last time you heard that from like someone going to a fine dining restaurant oh I can I can get a better meal at home no, like they don't say that. So, so for me, it's, it's pendulums. We had that pendulum. Everyone's trying to scale. Everyone's trying to grow. I absolutely see this pendulum as I travel around different countries, different cities, small towns. I'm seeing a major pendulum towards uber quality focused, uber hospitality heavy, um, attentively looking at how can I really make an impact in this person's life or interaction, um, which is awesome because now you have a discernible palette. You got to think, I've heard stories of when espresso machines were sold in the 70s in Seattle and there was, they had to call them cappuccino machines because nobody knew what espresso was. Um, and, the, you know, I think it was in the 60s, 70s, there was like four espresso machines. And to think now in Seattle, to think now where it's at is just massive. It's fascinating. Um, so that kind of leads me to why as a guy working for an espresso manufacturer talking to you about cafes or like you know memorable experiences um, so basically prior to this I used to work in the fine dining world um, I have done a number of different things and uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed along the process is just creating memorable experiences for people so one thing I want to get into this little guy oh sorry I've got my little phone on here um, yeah one thing in the uh, the the restaurant world, uh, I had a picture probably of the, uh, we can go back one. So that was like, you know, that was the espresso machine in the space, Arbor, um, which essentially it was a cafe by day, tasting menu that we changed the menu every couple weeks. And I did a whole new wine menu every week. Uh, and then we had an urban farm, bees, uh, grew about 60 different varieties of fruits and vegetables, uh, and then a catering company. So basically, I never saw my family. That's basically the gist. Um, I met a lot of amazing people because every person who would come in for the dinner would be a very different person usually than the morning and then the, the wedding. If I'm catering a 200-person you know, wedding and no mistakes are allowed. Um, or I meet dear friends like Dr. Prince who comes and hits me, hey, you want to buy some vegetables? And then we, you know, we hit it off. Um, it, was a, it was a beautiful space, and I think... When I think about that experience and what I learned and how it's applied to different sub sectors in the coffee industry, one thing that's very different about the fine dining world is your mode of interaction is much longer. A coffee shop, you're basically two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, but it's habitual. Where you get a fine dining experience, you share that moment with that person for four hours. And depending on how many touches on that table, you could touch that table 35 times that night. So the level of depth that you can get with someone, I can't tell you how many times people break down crying, telling me deep things about their life. 
swap phone numbers, like way deeper, like a broader depth. Now I see that with cafes, with people visiting, and I'm not saying everyone needs to create spaces like that, but I would say, I'll reference some books in the end, the sociologist who coined the phrase third place, he was identifying some elements about the American psyche and how we orient and how we put ourselves in places. And one thing he was talking a lot about is essentially these spaces are these amazing potential conduits for us to have meaningful dialogue. And this is something I think the specialty coffee world needs to get back to. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've interacted with where they reference the coffee industry. They wouldn't use specialty coffee, it's a coffee industry as gatekeeping, exclusionary, not accessible. And the, the reference that always comes to my mind is, is it intentional? And was it, was it something that was done from like a, a disposition of trying to exclude? Or was it more of this realm, like I used to be a graffiti head. So if you go into you know, a graffiti store, if you don't know anything about spray cans and tips and all this, it's a very weird subculture. Um, same thing with sneakers. But through hospitality, you can actually provide a conduit and you can read body language and see the person. They may not know what's happening. Oh yeah, check this out. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing. I mean, basically just people, not instead of going Ace Hardware or Home Depot, they're literally paying three times the amount for these types of shades and this and this. Like you can actually envelop and welcome someone. And, and I feel like that's one area that I'm hopeful that the coffee industry will like, adjust and work that lever like truly be inspired by the fine dining world's approach to hospitality, um, maybe a bit more meaningful, maybe a bit more intentional about how we read the room and read people and read body language. I mean, yeah, we would have these eight pages of steps of service and I don't know, I feel like sometimes we're running that realm where we have great relationships or people love working at the shop, but um, maybe how we define hospitality is gonna be different. Uh, I feel that's one area that you can really distinguish yourself from, from the, the, the herd in a sense. Um, but I would say uh, going into that, um, we'll go to the next little picture. Uh, yeah, that guy. Um, so within that process, something I learned, uh, essentially probably about 10 some odd years ago, if you wanted to get natural wines, or I would say wines made by a producer who really was putting as much nature in the bottle as possible. So they're not gonna use uh, yeast, uh, added yeast, it'll be indigenous yeast, they'll do no adjustments on sugars, acids. Most people don't realize in wine you can put uh, hundreds of ingredients and not label anything. So everything from fish guts to coloring agents, um, copper, like you can do all sorts of things. Um, and people don't realize that. And it's like they wonder why they have a headache and all this sort of stuff. I'm not of that realm that you know you need to drink these kind of types of wines to only have a great experience. But what I learned was there was an idea of, of um, hostility towards wine just as an overall subsection. Um, essentially, what would happen is uh, winemakers, I would buy their wines, I'd, I'd kind of explore this and I'd figure it out and I'm like, okay, I wanna put this on the menu. I'd pour it for someone and most of the people, because of the reputation we developed, most people would get wine pairings and it was, if I asked them, like, are you into wine? It was as if I asked, like, what's their political, like, association? What's their religion? Like, it, it was so weird. The answers were basically like, oh, yeah, I'm totally into wine. I collect all this. Or like, no, 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 I don't know anything. It was really fascinating. It wasn't as diverse as you'd think. So it made me think that so whole subsection of wine was inherently uh, intimidating. It was kind of something that didn't feel accessible. You gotta crack this $30 bottle, $50 bottle. You know, I'm just gonna go to Trader Joe's and get this $3 bottle, whatever. Um, so it felt like a major barrier associated with the entity of itself. Like, so for us, we were like, okay, cool. Let's make it playful, man. We literally developed a syntax. So every single bottle, um, I brought some bottles just so you could, as an idea, we'll, we'll actually taste these at the end. This isn't about wine, but it's just kind of a fun little thing. Um, so if you see something like this, what are your conduits of interpretation? It's in, in a different language. Uh, it probably doesn't say the variety. It probably doesn't say where it's from. Uh, you really don't know what's gonna happen inside that bottle. So you're basically trusting me or trusting a brand or something like that. And so when I thought about like, okay, how can I actually make this accessible? We, we basically created more categories. It's like, cool, hey, this is, uh, this is elegant. 
maybe leaning towards crushable, you can just throw it back. Think about like, you know, classic actress like Audrey Hepburn or someone playful like Cuba Gooden Jr. Like, you know, he's just, he's just funny. Okay, cool. Uh, and then you go something like a spot bagunder, which is an unusual variety. People aren't necessarily going to know what to do with it. Um, but this gets more towards the provocative. That's like a David Lynch film. He doesn't care what you think about his film. He's going to make it and he's going to go forward. So you might only want one glass. But if you're with some friends, it could be this very memorable experience. And then this goes more in that audacious leaning towards elegant um, southern France, a little bit higher extraction, but a really wild avant-garde producer, kind of highly allocated type thing. Um, aromatics seem to be huge and all that sort of stuff. So that kind of in our world currently in coffee is, is probably like stuff by Diego Bermudez in Colombia, where he's really pushing what Colombian coffee can be. Um, that doesn't mean anyone needs to like one thing or another. All I want to do, I want to provide the conduit and then you can freely decide and experience and all that. So that kind of led me in uh, to basically, all right, I got to develop a wine club. Um, Cause basically people were kept telling me they didn't know where to buy these things. So that's basically this, which is basically, I mean, the copy on that uh, is, you know, playfully intentional because I just felt like all the wine clubs were all the same, same. It was all about margin, all about branding and all this. And um, so for me, it was really like, I firmly understood the physical gathering was essential for like knowledge acquisition. I couldn't, it couldn't just be book knowledge. It couldn't just be what I'm telling you. They had to actually be there and taste. And so they can develop their own palate and, and discover. Um, and then I had to do good write-ups, kind of like Hemingway-esque short declarative sentences you know, where you provide just a little bit and then let them make it their own. Because if I just start talking and talking, it's like, well, I guess I don't know anything. You're inherently like stunting their growth. Um, anyways, um, so, so that was like a fascinating learning experience. Everything from user experience design, product development, uh, behavioral psychology, how like, I mean, just so many avenues uh, in that world. Um, and that kind of leads me to after leaving Arbor. Um, this is 108, um, kind of one of the other talks is in Copenhagen, so I thought it was fitting. Um, this is probably one of my favorite shops I've ever been to in my life. Sadly, it, it was a victim of uh, the coronavirus and closed. Um, but I think this will be a great segue into the crux of this talk and discussion. Uh, and that's really what makes something exceptional, like what makes it special. Um, yeah, how do, you, how do you create something like that? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like you can analyze it or you can experience it, but like if you broke down the little components, it needs this, 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 this. I mean, we have that with like storylines. Like how, how do you create a novel? Cool, we, we know, we know what we need to do. And if you break from that, you have to do other things for it to make sense or else it just doesn't fit. We know that with color theory. We know that with, uh, I mean, there's literally a book on a, like a thousand page book treatise on uh, architectural design and put these many windows and this and this and this. But for some reason in coffee, we, I don't know, it's, we're, I feel like sometimes we like, we regurgitate the same designs or we like go through little phases and, and I'm a little bit more hopeful of kind of some of the stuff I was referencing earlier. Like if you can trust yourself, you can trust what you like and what unique attributes and skills and experiences and then take some steps and areas and levers uh, that are all going to make sense, but it's going to be authentically you. That's like up and down through economic crises, whatever, like people relate with things that are real. They're tangible. They're authentic. Um, that's why, you know, Arbor's tasting menus and all that, like that's why that worked. Like all the people had worked together for like four or five years. We spent a ton of time together. We made almost everything in the restaurant. Like, so it was like, whether you like it or not, like you couldn't deny the authenticity of it. Um, so uh, let's go through this. So basically that, on that picture, uh, you can't really see it super well, but basically this is like a little chocolate tart that was like expertly crafted. Uh, a cup of Gitche Thaini from uh, Tim Wendebo and then a, a glass of Matassa. Um, the restaurant was the first restaurant in Noma, um, invested in to my knowledge 
uh, super talented chefs. So how that place worked, I wish I could show you like I had a, like a little video, but I didn't want everyone creeping out watching a little video. We'll put it maybe online. Um, it was probably 400 square feet, uh, maybe, maybe 800 square feet, but it had about 20 foot ceilings, no three compartment sink. That was shared in the back. Prep, all that happened. That was shared with the kitchen next door. Uh, visible bottles everywhere so you knew like they serve wine but then the approach to hospitality right when you walk up the counter there's a bucket bunch of these wines and you may think you're just coming in for a coffee but it's like this is here and how they talk about it the hospitality is like yeah sure I'll get this and this. I, I can't tell you I haven't gone to a cafe since where I'm gonna order a glass of wine and a cup of coffee and a tart but I was there and I'm like man I'm here for it this is amazing like this is beautiful um, that pastry chef is Wickedly, wickedly talented. So what do they do? They do two items. They're not doing 30 items. They're not like the acceptable mediocrity that's, you know, people are keep buying it, but do they really like it? No, it's just good enough. You know, the power of that, you know, that's a, another conversation. Um, but for me, so I basically post Arbor, I sat down and I was like, man, I can't have this like crazy business owner brain, which the business owner brain, the entrepreneurial brain, you're always analyzing. You're always picking things apart. You're always like, all right, how's it working this way? I wonder what their deal was and blah, 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 blah. And that's not conducive to relationships outside of other business owners. So my wife was like, you gotta stop. So I basically created a form and I would basically do tone, lighting, ethos, um, uh, core elements. Um, and I'd write the date and I'd give myself 10 minutes and I'd just break it apart. And, and it was fascinating to see how, what you could learn and observe. And it's like that place worked because it's the main thoroughfare as a bridge going over to downtown. And you get a ton of tourist traffic, but then you get locals. If you try to pluck that out and put it in Chicago somewhere, you have to pick the exact neighborhood and the right partnership and all. It's, it's, and that honestly started helping me understand the power of contextualization. And like I studied intercultural studies. I've lived around the world. But like, I didn't put that with, oh, a business. Like a business, you actually need to understand the subcultural value sets of an area. And if they don't like connect with what you wanna do, then you basically either have to educate, you have to align with theirs, um, or you need to change your model, basically. And like so many businesses I've seen like adjust or fail or this, it's, that's like such a key, key part. In the restaurant world, because the margin is so small, a lot of people talk about the power of a deal. So they'll basically talk about how you structure a deal um, with a landlord. And that could be a make or break of a business. I can't name the business locally, but been around 20 some odd years, iconic, amazing chefs. Their margins are so small, like they basically don't make any money on their business. They just make money on catering. And you would think like, dude, they're like this. They're always busy in this. And it's like, it's the power of the structured deal. Like if they negotiated a deal where they had maybe the basement is not quite 10 feet and so you can't actually charge market rate and you locked in here and here, like now, now you have this viable concept. Um, but sometimes that danger is you visit that and you see it and you don't realize that and then you try to emulate it and copy it and you're literally copying an impossible formula. Um, so I think that's part of that's why I'm also very excited about the next speaker because hopefully it'll be some of the more business sense around how we're structuring deals. Um, so we're gonna go a couple more items and then we'll get into the actual levers. Um, so it's not gonna look like this. This is probably one of the most talented pastry chefs in the world. Um, I mean, you know, it's a lofty claim, a guy named uh, Michael uh, Lasconis. Uh, crazy talented. He was at El uh, Berdanen in New York. Um, and this is like his analysis of every way of cooking and methodology of preparation, which is like, what are you talking about, dude? Like it's every, every single little breakout of thing. That's not the path. Like that takes a very specific brain to see something like that. We're going to go more in the next one. Um, and the next one's more in understanding those actual levers um, and when I get into that I would say like maybe some things in Chicago we've heard so let's say let's say ha has anyone heard the um, solar powered 
uh, comment about a cafe. Not solar powered like panels, but like, oh, that cafe is solar powered. So what that means is basically that cafe is so busy on the basis of they have a massive patio and that patio basically drives that revenue. So that's Collectivo, Lakeview. Um, I mean, it's a killer example. Like the numbers that they would do there versus another location, it's like, oh, it's a solar power. Um, Big Star for tacos. I mean, that friggin' pushes that whole restaurant group selling tacos on the basis of basically a massive patio. That only works in our context. That's not gonna work necessarily in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> like, you know, so that's the contextualization part, I think is quite, um, quite key. Um, and then another one I would say is probably like mind the flow of traffic in Chicago. Hey, you wanna put your property on the corner, but make sure it's going towards the highway, not away from the highway. Like that makes sense in Chicago because a lot of people drive. Um, we are walkable, but not, not crazy, crazy. Um, but there's also the pandemic taught us shops in the city that were based in neighborhoods did exceptionally well or shops that didn't close and they kept open. We basically saw them build rapport with their local community and they felt like we were in it together and they, they, they climbed, they did well. Um, so I think we're kind of readjusting some of these ideas. Um, I would say this is kind of like a little, I think, helpful statement. Um, so I've, I've been thinking a lot about like when we're navigating these levers, a lot of people, I think when you're starting out the business, it's like you hear language like workflow and layout and uh, let's say earnings per square foot, like earning potential or pro forma driven business model, like all these things. And you'd think those are the levers um, and they are. But wh like, why don't people talk about the other like more, I would say, magical um, difference making type levers uh, like, I don't know, the memorable hospitality or like the tone or ethos of a space. If you think about like a brand and, you know, I be careful who I'm mentioning and calling out, but like it, it, there's there's a very famous marketer. He said it, not me. So there's a very famous marketer, Seth Godin. Uh, if you're interested in marketing, I would read him. Uh, and he mentioned if Nike opened a hotel, we have a pretty good idea of what it would look like. But if Hilton, Hilton's great, they do great stuff, but if they open a hotel or open, let's say, some shoes or you know, launch a shoe or launch a clothing, whatever, we wouldn't really know what it is. So it's kind of this difference between a logo and an entity and like a brand. And then when I think about people building out cafes and retail experiences, I honestly feel like one of the biggest things is they get lopped up, especially in our day and age with social media, visuals, in what they think is the brand. And it's actually just marketing assets and logos. And it's not actually the ethos and the tone, the brand and how it makes you feel. And when you go there. And so then it's just, OK, let's decide. What do you want to do? Do you want to do $20,000 a day, no food drive through running on, you know, two Lamarzoco PBs? Like, yeah, they exist. And they're drive throughs and they're crushing it. Um, but then you also have this shop that everyone goes to and it's beautiful and the music is so tight and the approach to hospitality and they make everything like, cool, you can do that too. But like, trying to figure out what you know, tone you're kind of going after in, in a sense. Um, so if we go into those actual levers, I want to explore those a little bit and then we'll look at a couple of spots and then we'll have some question and answer. So, um, if I just read through these, like, and, you know, there's more, but for me, these are top, top line ones that I want to focus on. I always think about, um, and I will very transparently say when I travel a lot, these are the things I think about when I see spaces, I'm putting the piece together when I'm in Detroit, when I'm in Cincinnati, I'm trying to put together, how does this city like show up in these areas? So if you look at subcultural values, um, it's pretty hard to discern, but you know, you pay attention, you kind of look at it, it starts to become clear. Um, you figure out how you can align with those, um, with a given audience. Uh, and, and honestly, it's crazy. Like it can be like a neighborhood. It could be not even like a broader neighborhood. It could be like a block. Um, so yeah, that just being mindful of that. Um, the core, that's like basically the components of the focus of the business. If you said metric, what is that? If you said day glow this, it's not really a mission statement. It's not really like their one line sub ID. It's deeper than that. It's a deeper amalgamation of kind of all those little elements. Um, 
I would say the anchoring elements, those are finishes, those are color, those are 14 foot ceilings, um, sculpturally placed espresso machine, like those anchor elements are so important to like just pick out. Um, and then the environment, that's more like pondering the essential nature of our interaction with the product, um, which is, I know these are like lofty ideas and we can talk about them after. Uh, it's not to be lofty, it's literally, these are like tools in your kit that you can like, you know, mess with and interact with. Um, hospitality, are you gonna be warm? Are you gonna be precise but professional? Um, are you gonna be infectious, memorable? Um, or maybe it's gonna be more of the, you're just hired to do a job and so it's a factory, it's soulless, um, it's lackadaisical. Like, most people don't choose to do that. Like, very honestly, like, they're not choosing, that's what I'm gonna do, but from a receiving aspect, that's what you're actually interacting with. Um, last couple ones, I would say location. Is it heavy on foot traffic? Is it heavy on drive, like, drive through, or is it momentary? Is it, oh, early in the morning you drive heavy, and then, you know, evening, not as much, um, tapers down. You know, I see p spots like, oh, we're gonna do this all day cafe, all, and it's like, cool, is there a market for it? Are you talking to the right people? Are you setting up the tone to support that concept? Um, lighting, lighting design uh, is, I would say, probably one of the biggest elements that people neglect in the coffee world. Uh, restaurants get it, for sure. Uh, cafes, I think it's an afterthought. It's usually something that don't wanna spend money on. They usually don't understand the power that it has to like transform a space. One helpful thing, turn all your lights to 2700K, and that's a start. Um, but if you wanna get more you know, detailed with it, anywhere that you have work areas or showing product, do higher, but not, not going to the, the you know, units that you're basically gonna have a blue tinge. It's not an appealing environment. You know, they basically torture people with that lighting or you know, film sets. Um, and then product, I would say, that's something more like, is it a focus on consistency or quality, or maybe even we referenced that earlier, the home barista. Maybe you're gonna be the spot that, you, this is the spot that makes the best espresso in the city, or this is a spot that um, no matter who you are, you can stay for however long and this and this, like you will be seen, you will be heard. That's the trick. Every single human being wants to be seen and they wanna be heard. So if you're operating a business and you're you know, kind of running that dream and that vision, but you're not seeing people properly, you're not hearing them, and you're just so focused on the business, like, are, like what are you leaving on the table as far as the, the space that you can create? Um, we'll wrap up with just looking at a couple little spots. I know this is usually like more engagement, banter, poking holes in my thoughts, but um, yeah. Uh, I just wanna show a couple little spots. I, you know, I'm in Chicago and I work for a company that I, I really try to be friendly with everyone. So to pick spots to showcase, I was like, I'm just gonna pick spots that have opened in the last like year and a half. Um, so this is a spot um, up north, understudy, which is basically part bookstore, part uh, cafe, community center, um, gathering spot. If, if we just observe this, and it's hard on a static image, you'd have to like, you'd have to walk in. Does it smell like an unclean floor sink? Does it, sound like the barista just plays what they want to play at a volume and not thinking about anyone else in the room. Um, do, are people talking to each other? Are people reading papers? Um, just all those sorts of little things. Uh, but yeah, it's like, what's the client like? What's the community like? Um, what's making them tick? If I say like finishes, is it more fine woodworking or is it on the job site contractor finished woodworking? Like that makes such a difference in the whole package um, together. Um, and the next one, um, this is Loba, which I think is fascinating. It's like referential of like some Scandinavian design, but she's um, a lovely Mexican woman who is basically doing a very focused cultural experience on like Mexican patisserie and, and food and having partners and people within her community be a part of this process. So it wasn't like I'm gonna hire this big fancy firm. It was my barista who worked for me started doing woodworking and got really good. And so she's let them design everything in there and it's like banging. And you know, it's like such a cool, soulful spot. Um, 
yeah, it, to me, it also feels very Chicago. The finishes, the lighting, Chicago attributes, architecture, uh, you know, inventing a skyscraper. Um, we have height, we have expansion, it's multicultural. So that feels of the moment. And then, then this one, um, this is a stereo FM. So this is the uh, new location down across the street from the Google headquarters. Um, you know, cafe by morning, bar sort of gathering at night. They have some little mod bars integrated in there and some taps and a disco ball. It's very playful and fun. But again, the finishes are, um, I would say, very modern and classic at the same time. Um, so then if we start going through the hospitality and the experience, usually I see the same people there. Uh, usually they're like pretty friendly and it's just like a great little spot to get an espresso um, and you know just connect with people and they're usually working on something one little I don't know how public it is but they're lovely people they have a unique part if you work there and you create a signature beverage the owners uh, share profit of that beverage on all sales for that which is like dude that freaking that's a crazy little unique element um, to to drive uh, creativity so we'll wrap up with uh, some little further readings. Um, this is like a broad range of stuff, but everything from user experience design, product development, um, photography, some kind of business orientation type stuff. But um, we'll, I guess we'll put some sort of link or something there. Uh, I would say, honestly, when I think about like overall with like what we're trying to do and what, where specialty coffee is going, there's like, there's a pretty broad opportunity. I mean, if you look at, you look at emerging markets like China, uh, where they don't have the average per capita consumption, but you see people buying espresso machines at Costco, like expensive ones. And you see Indonesia people opening these beautiful, crazy shops and these little outdoor areas and the greenery, it's like, it's really inspiring how specialty coffee is growing. I mean, one of the coolest coffee experiences recently was in a very small town in Honduras, visiting a producer and getting awesome food, awesome coffee. And it was just like, wow, specialty coffee is really growing big. So uh, I guess my parting thoughts would be, again, don't listen to me, like kind of trust yourself, hopefully develop what you like and what you're interested in. Uh, utilize the mechanisms, the tools, the levers, and send me an email or message. I'm happy to talk. So, yeah. Woo.